Good morning and welcome to our final ESG and Sustainability Webinar for 2022. Don't worry, there will be more webinars scheduled for 2023. Now, in this final webinar, in the final month of the year, we're talking about ESG due diligence. So I'm Aleda Bosov, I'm the National Leader for ESG and Sustainability here at BDO. But luckily, um, for all of you, I won't be talking about ESG uh, due diligence today. For that, um, I've got with me Ashley Bleeker and Hamish Ogilvy, but I'll get them to introduce themselves. Hello, Ashley, and hello, Hamish. Hey, morning, Hamish, would you like to go first to introduce yourself? Happy to. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Hamish Ogilvy is my name. I'm a corporate, pi corporate finance partner in the Melbourne practice. Uh, I specialise in transaction services and due diligence, uh, and so I'll be bringing some insights to you on how we think about uh, ESG due diligence in the broader uh, due diligence um, frame this morning. And for those of you that have dialed in the previous webinars, you've probably unfortunately seen my face before and heard my voice before. Ashley Bleeker is my name. I am a director in the ESG and sustainability team. I work closely with Letter and also help advise clients on strategy and activation around ESG and do some work with Hamish uh, in and around evaluation uh, of ESG issues as well. So looking forward to this discussion. So thank you, um, Ashley and Hamish, and it's really great to have you here, uh, um, Hamish, to join Ashley and I uh, to break the South African accent a little bit. It's always good. Um, then, you know, we would like to start um, or we would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we, and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, I've talked earlier about our sustainability webinar series. series Sorry. As you know, Sorry. Yes. Um, the slides aren't moving forward for me. I'm still on slide one, so I don't know if anyone else, others may be having Oh, that's problem. not good. There we not go. Good at all. Thank good. you, Ash. You should be seeing it now. Thank you yeah. very much. Right. Um, so earlier I've said that this is the last sustainability and ESG webinar uh, for 2022, and we've just released our schedule for 2023 webinars. So we kick off just after Australia now, the 31st of January, and we talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the World Economic Forum International Business Council frameworks, um, and when they are good to use, when they would be appropriate. And BDO Australia did use the, the WEF IBC to prepare our own sustainability report. Then only two weeks later, um, in February, we talk about addressing your carbon footprint, I know a lot of the organisations to which we speak at the moment are interested in their carbon footprint or their baseline carbon footprint, and then how do we improve that carbon footprint over time. In March, we talk about the TCFDs and the latest developments at the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board. And we know that the TCFD disclosures are being promoted by regulators in Australia, and therefore, we want to start by focusing on them. But we also know that the TCFDs are being incorporated into the ISSB's um, IFRS S2 standard. So we want to look at the two of them together. Then on the 12th of April, that's my oldest daughter's birthday, the 12th of April, she's turning 22, uh, getting the board on board. And um, so how do we, as finance teams, sustainability professionals um, put together a business case for sustainability because we know we need the board on board in order to progress um, this agenda. Uh, so Lena, in May, will, will, yeah. you be inviting, will you be inviting your daughter to attend that webinar as a birthday present for her or not? Oh, I reckon that would be the worst ever present. She would run away um, and not appear <laughs> at all. <laughs> I would love for her to come, Ashley, but she wouldn't come. Not for any, not on her birthday, never. <laughs> but you, and you also, you did say about the first one in January, I think you said for those people that are on holidays, your expectation is that they'll still dial in to listen to the webinar from their banana lounge, didn't you? 
Of course, Ashley, all these committed attendees of our webinars will be here on the 31st of January. Um, <laughs> and then on the 17th of May, we talk about GRI standards. We know that's a very comprehensive set of standards around sustainability. So we'll um, do a very high level overview of it when it's appropriate in some of the disclosures. And then 14 June, incredibly important. As we approach 30 June 2023, and we have to think how do we incorporate sustainability information into the financial report, or how do we include sustainability report together with the financial statements in the financial report, or what are the other alternatives available? Um, so that's why we've got that in June. Um, the other thing I should highlight is we also do monthly IFRS and corporate reporting webinars. And because sustainability reporting is so intrinsically linked to financial reporting, if you look at our website, our 2023 IFRS webinars, uh, the topics will go up uh, within the next day or so, but those topics uh, are very much around sustainability as well. So we've got a whole session on IFRS S1 and a whole session on IFRS S2. So I think there will be some topics that you would be interested in as well. So the sustainability webinar series is very much talking about the strategy, the carbon, the activation, um, and all the different frameworks. Where in the IFRS series, uh, we talk about the ISSB standards a lot. And, and the link with financial reports and financial statements. So that's a little bit of a difference uh, between the two. Now, last month when we had our webinar on ESG linked remuneration, uh, we did say that at BDO we're incredibly proud of our inaugural sustainability report. And we gave you a little bit of an overview. So this is a reminder. If you want to look at our sustainability report that Ashley and I have worked on, um, you can download it from our website. It gives you a really good idea on how you can tell your story to your stakeholders. Um, and, you know, it, with the World Economic uh, Forum, IBC, there's the four pillars, um, and you can see how BDO has structured our report uh, to meet um, the requirements of the framework. Uh, we're very proud of, of this report, um, and this is just the report on on one page uh, where we talk about all the things we do around people, um, you know, the gender split, uh, but the important stuff for us really, the net promoter score of 62.4, our people engagement score of 77%, which was an improvement uh, from the previous year, 75 to 77, and um, the training we do in, in particularly the number of new mental health and first aid officers we've got at BDO, incredibly important, uh, the total training hours and also the training hours per employee. So in an incredible amount of things that BDO do around people, we're a people business. Our why is people helping people achieve their dreams. So we believe in investing in people. But we've also disclosed what we do around the planet and our commitment to be net zero by 2050 or before. Uh, we're currently busy with our baseline a carbon footprint calculation, and we expect to receive that before Christmas. Uh, but we also are very proud of the reduction in paper use and also the number of trees to be planted as we design and locate our new premises uh, in Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane. Um, around prosperity, the revenue of the firm for the first time um, in BDO Australia, more than 400 million. Uh, tax that we've paid more than 100 million. Uh, we've employed 200, uh, 2,141 people at BDO, 12 offices across Australia. Uh, we've got 245 partners, or we had 245 partners at 30 June. I think that could have changed since then. Uh, a number of new partners and directors. And the last thing at the bottom on the right hand is the number of pro bono hours um, and what it's worth, as well as the number of hours we spend on community uh, projects. Of all of that in our sustainability report. And then last one, principles of governance, um, incredibly important, what we do around cybersecurity and also our audit um, division, um, how they support the trust and the, um, in um, the capital markets 
and the great work they do. So there's a link to our transparency report. And then finally, at 30 June, we had one out of eight board members were female. And as of Monday this week, two out of eight of those board members are now female. So we've gone from 12.5% at 30 June to 25%. And definitely that's something for next year's sustainability report. So please read our sustainability report. We're incredibly proud of it, but it will also give you ideas of how Ashley and, and I can help you to draft a sustainability report for your business. Now, I think that is enough from my side. At this stage, I'll hand over to Hamish and Ashley around the ESG due diligence session for today. So over to Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen many of the previous webinars, we thought a really important starting point for today's discussion around due diligence was to focus on, let's just have a very quick discussion around definitions and focus on what we actually mean when we talk about ESG due diligence. And some of you will have seen this representation before because we've showed it in previous webinars. But when we talk about sustainability or ESG, there are different ways to frame it, different ways to phrase it. But generally what we're talking about is eliminating practices that harm people or the planet or compromise the lives of future generations. And within that bubble of sustainability, we typically think about those three areas, environment, social and governance, E, S and G. And within each of those, we think about a bunch of different issues and these are some of the common themes that we see organisations and consumers focusing on or asking questions about. Now, many people, I had a question, I was doing some filming last week and I, the first question that I was asked was, so ESG is just about climate change, right? And I think it was a bit of a Dorothy Dixer because obviously ESG is far more than climate change. Climate change is a big issue. Global warming is a big issue, uh, but it's not the only issue in the environment bucket. And so we've talked through these before. We know that it also includes things like pollution, things like biodiversity, things like recycling and waste management and uh, energy efficiency as well. Social is all about how we engage with people, how do we engage with our employees, diversity, equity, inclusion, employee engagement, health and safety, wellness, how do we engage with our customers, What's the satisfaction level with our service or products? How do we engage with our supply chain? Are we sure that human rights are being respected the whole way back in our supply chain? And how do we engage with the communities that we work on, that we work in or that we rely on for our prosperity as an organisation? And then, as you know, governance is all about how do we wrap procedures and processes around these things to make sure everything works effectively. A lot of it can focus on uh, business ethics, so bribery and corruption, modern slavery, uh, executive remuneration, but it also includes things like risk management uh, and importantly, even more so today than ever before, data security uh, as well. So, so from a definitional perspective, when we talk about ESG due diligence, what we're talking about is due diligence over one or more of any of these issues. So we thought it was just important to start at that point. Thanks, Ash. See, the uh, erudite chartered accountants on the webinar today will no doubt have fond memories of triple bottom line reporting from their CA program studies and its predecessor, PY. Triple bottom line reporting was really an early attempt to capture reporting and disclosure of ESG initiatives for capital markets participants in Australia and across the globe. Some corporates uh, incorporated TBL reporting into their annual reports before 2010. However, it, it's really taken the best part of the last decade for real transaction on ESG to occur. And the, the ESG, as Ash has just defined it uh, today, is really influenced by the messages that we receive from our stakeholder groups and the growing chorus uh, uh, that's growing louder uh, so whilst much of the evidence behind ESG is still anecdotal, there are several key stakeholders across the ESG agenda are making the impetus for action very clear. Some examples uh, on the slide today, uh, in terms of the ESG stakeholders, we think about consumers. Uh, 
79% of consumers based on a Capgemini report in 2020 were changing or are changing their purchase preferences based on sustainability initiatives. So brand and reputation um, becomes a very key issue where customers are willing to pay to go green. So despite the fact that there are clear, clear discrepancies in practice, um, McKinsey research indicates that more than 70% of consumers surveyed on purchases across multiple industries, uh, automotive, building, electronics and packaging would pay an additional 5% for a green product if it met the same performance standards as a non-green alternative. Thanks, just uh, slide nine, yeah. Um, from a regulatory perspective, um, it's very clear that uh, investors driven uh, heavily influenced by the US capital markets are very likely to engage in shareholder activism on companies' operations focused on uh, the impact of supply chain and greenhouse gas emissions. And many of them actually expect more litigation as a result of companies not delivering on their ESG promises. So risk mitigation, uh, to the extent it wasn't already a priority through due diligence, is now um, increasingly so. And stronger, having a stronger external value proposition can really enable companies to achieve greater strategic freedoms, easing regulatory pressures. And in fact, uh, case after case across sectors and geographies um, show that strength in ESG actually helps reduce companies' risk of uh, adverse government action. And there are plenty of examples in the, uh, in the power generation and oil and gas space. On the employer side of things, um, given the challenges we've, we have all faced and, and most, bus well, most businesses have faced over the last couple of years, in particular around uh, attracting and retaining uh, quality staff, um, having a, a strong ESG proposition can really help us all attract and retain the quality employees that we seek enhancing their motivation um, by giving them a sense of purpose uh, and increasing their productivity overall and there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that um, that suggests that's very much the case. In terms of the investor stakeholder group, um, there's strong expectation for companies to establish and communicate a net zero plan and these include both you know upstream investors uh, in you know, unlisted funds thinking you know infrastructure and property but also uh, you know, um, uh, individuals, individual investors in uh, enlisted entities uh, on our capital markets. Having a strong ESG proposition uh, can not only enhance investment returns, um, because it, not uh, by allocating capital to more promising and sustainable opportunities, for example, renewables, waste reduction, uh, et cetera, but it also helps companies avoid stranded investments that may not pay off because of the longer term environmental issues. Uh, so, so, you know, that can cause massive write down in the value of assets. And we've seen that very recently um, with our listed energy generators. Uh, in terms of, of um, the executives and M&A executives in particular, uh, a very large cohort expect that their own company's focus on ESG will increase over the next three years. And we're certainly seeing that come down the pipeline in terms of the ESG due diligence aspects across the, the broader uh, diligence stream and deal life cycle. And those sort of focuses that are coming through in due diligence activities um, can really help drive top line growth uh, in cost reductions. You know, you can attract both uh, B2B and B2C customers with more sustainable products. And that's evidenced by the research into consumer purchasing preferences, uh, better access to resources, both uh, government and private capital markets. And there's really an ability to optimise costs through better procurement, in particular energy procurement, procurement waste reduction, uh, etc. So all of these views from these key stakeholder groups are driving the changing preferences and are starting to significantly impact value as we think about it in the context of due diligence enterprise value. Whilst I'm much sure. of the evidence... Sorry. Go ahead. Could I just add a comment just to the investment aspect of this? Sure. If if now's a good time. Sure. Um, what, the other thing that's happening is everyone's part of a value chain. And so a lot of these organisations have increasing ESG commitments and ESG awareness placed on them as well. And so investors, just as one example, are subject to a lot more scrutiny around this space. And many of them 
uh, publicly signing up to various ESG initiatives. So you, many of you would have heard of the UN's Principles for Responsible Investment. <clears throat> they have, uh, I think, 5,000 signatories globally. They've got over 250 across Australasia, which obviously includes Australia, but other places. That's asset owners, investment managers, uh, service providers as well. And as, as when they're a signatory to these types of things, they have to, or they're undertaking to incorporate ESG issues into their investment analysis, ESG issues into their ownership policies, ESG issues into um, their disclosure requirements. And so they can't not incorporate ESG into due diligence or anything else around ownership. So it's almost like this is going to become mandatory for them um, if they choose to behave as a um, as a model signatory to these types of arrangements. But even beyond those obligations, Ash, I think the, the leading investors are, have already identified that um, you know, embedding ESG policies and, and uh, procedures into your modus operandi really does significantly impact your uh, access, um, you know, be benefit your access to capital, uh, lower cost of capital, um, and has the real prospect of enhancing investment returns. So they, they're doing it not only to be good uh, and you know, moral corporate citizens, but also because it does benefit returns. And there's a growing body, body of empirical research that suggests just, just that. So Kevin, is they're that, making money out of ESG. Is that what you're saying? That is that that is the case. Yeah, who would have thought? So whilst much of the evidence though to date is, is anecdotal, there is a growing body of empirical research that really does validate the anecdotal experience, uh, that there is a premium placed on strong ESG performance. Next slide, please, Letter. Thank you very much. So whilst triple bottom line reporting really encouraged us to consider some of the ESG issues in due diligence, the reality is that very little credence was placed on evaluating these issues in the past, albeit with some limited exception. And in the past, I'm really probably referring up to, you know, up to the up to probably 20, 2019 when um, when traction really started um, uh, gaining momentum. However, ignoring ESG issues in diligence today is really at one's peril. Most of the leading businesses that we work with embed ESG diligence across the deal life cycle and M&A value chain, and they deliver it as a core work stream, giving at least the same attention to ESG matters through due diligence as the more traditional due diligence work streams, including financial, tax, legal, and operational. For example, if we break the deal life cycle down into four phases being identification of opportunities, execution of those deals, uh, delivery and integration, and then value realisation or maximisation, we can see and we do see that leading businesses have created an ESG strategy that forms a key pillar of their overall uh, corporate strategy. And what this results in is ESG factors such as those we've discussed uh, earlier feature really strongly in any due diligence program. So um, to bring some examples to life during the identification phase, in, in identifying the right deal, every initial opportunity will be assessed against um, a series of ESG elements that are already embodied in the ESG strategy, including the policies procedures. In the execution phase, having initially screened targets on ESG factors, the execution phase will seek to analyse these in more detail and where possible quantify the financial impacts from a value perspective, um, looking at value creation opportunities, but also risk mitigants. In the delivery phase, having executed on a deal, the focus switches to things like the 100 day 100 day plans to embed the identified uh, ESG value creation opportunities and risk mitigation measures into operational standup, including aligning uh, target organisation uh, policies and procedures with overarching ESG strategies that were taken into the opportunity in the identification phase. In terms of value realisation, this is really a continuation of the process where ESG strategies, uh, policies and frameworks um, uh, are created and empower, importantly, empower employees to innovate, to bring ideas to help the organisation become a sector leader 
uh, in ASJ. And Ash, I think, would you like? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Hayden. And, and I think, you know, the bottom half of this slide is, is really us trying to demonstrate that um, in conducting a, a due diligence exercise, there are component parts of the due diligence and ESG really just becomes another component part of the exercise that you can't afford to ignore anymore. Um, and, you know, as with a lot of those buckets on the slide we shared earlier, a lot of issues are popping up here that have significant impacts on real business issues and real business factors that ultimately influence a DD outcome or that ultimately influence the price at which someone purchases or the price at which someone sells. So again, under environmental, the big one, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, people are required to report it, but it will become a big issue if there's ever a carbon price. And so if you have to start paying for the amount of carbon you produce, then the size of your carbon footprint will become a big issue. And some organisations we know are already thinking about what the implementation of the carbon price might do to their balance sheet or their PL. Climate change, as we all know, is a massive issue. Now, this includes physical and transition risks. So physical risks are um, changing climate conditions and extreme weather events. So not just the, the overall changing climate, but what's happening with fires, what's happening with floods, what's happening with droughts. And obviously in Australia, um, we're lucky enough to whack the trifecta and we get all of them. But if you think about what it means for business risk, what this means um, lower asset values in some cases, this means increased insurance premiums in some cases, and this can also mean um, supply chain disruption in some cases as well. So, then if you think about transition risk around this as well, right? this is about you know, innovative technologies, uh, this is about social adaptation, so what are consumers and other people in your value chain going to be doing in the future? And what are the policy and regulatory changes that are likely to have an impact on this? So, so from a financial aspect, what does that mean to changes in um, pricing behaviour and demand behaviour? Um, what does it mean for stranded assets in some cases? What does it mean for defaults on loans? And you know, what does it mean for an increased likelihood of penalties uh, or business disruption that stems from enforcement action if regulators start to get more teeth in this space? Uh, there's a few others there, I won't run through them all, uh, but environmental management obviously becomes a big uh, risk to think about and assess as well. Uh, so too does the, the impact of a product portfolio and your exposure to the circular economy theme, so either you're part of a circular economy or you're not part of a circular economy. Social, again, really interesting, like this is, as I said, all about people. So what happened? What are you doing in relation to health and safety? Is that likely to be an issue going forward? Are counterparts that you have likely to alter their, their contracting behaviour with you based on your health and safety record? The answer we know is already yes, today it happens. Uh, what, are, what happens if there's a risk to the way that you engage with local communities? What about your people? You know, if there's a risk to your diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, what does that mean for retention? What does that mean for your recruitment costs or your staffing costs going forward? Uh, and also in your supply chain, how are you monitoring risks in your supply chain, right? So what if there's some kind of human rights breach, whether it be modern slavery or otherwise, and what impact does that have on the business? Product responsibility, some classic examples here, you know, if you're, providing uh, firearms to the market, if you're providing alcohol to the market, if you're providing a uh, poker machine or gaming facilities to the market, these are all things that carry a reputational risk with them because of the impact that they have or can have on the users or purchases of those products. And so factoring in the impact of, of your product is also important in all this. And then lastly, governance, all of these things can have an impact on the way that the business, the way that someone would value or think about value in the business. And a lot of it is around risk management. How do you manage some of these risks in the business? How do you manage your bribery and corruption risk? Um, how do you manage your remuneration risk? How do you manage any other business ethics risks? How do you manage your data security risk? All those types of things. And so as you can see, each of these components starts to have a real impact on some of the financial drivers of any business that you would look at. Yeah, I think importantly, Ash, um, what it really highlights is that 
in assessing any opportunity, any investment opportunity, even if it's it doesn't involve the you know uh, the sale or purchase of of um, of a business, really necessitates having a, a process that allows you to methodically work through, identify, and work through each of the ESG issues. But then during the execution phase, get into get under the hood, um, do some rigorous analysis to quantify what the likely impacts are. Um, so you can reassess the you know future cash flows um, and the impact that it will have on the uh, you know multiples being um, uh, on which businesses are being traded and also the completion adjustments through working capital uh, and net debt. Next slide, please. So we thought it might be useful to just highlight. Um, what an indicative process might look like when you conduct a due diligence on an organisation or, or any other entity. And um, there's a picture of a T-shirt in the background here because we've just chosen to do this in the context of, say, the textiles industry uh, or a textiles producer. But really, there's four parts to the process if you want to break it down to its most simplest core. So there's, I suppose, the scope, including um, where you draw the line on materiality. There's the data analysis. Um, following the data analysis, there's a risk assessment process that you would go through, and then there is a quantification uh, and reporting element to it. And the process can be either broad brush uh, and kind of based on first principles, or it can be quite detailed with a lot of analysis and a lot of modeling. And where you draw the line on how deep you go into this will be based on the likely impact of some of these things on the future value of the business. But just to, just to, I suppose, explain this in more detail, I'm not wanting to repeat what's on the slide. You know, the starting point about working out what, what the scope is going to be for one of those exercises is thinking about the complexity of the supply chain uh, and thinking about the roles that things like human rights might play in, in this case, again, for textiles. Thinking about what customer expectations might be uh, and then the thinking about whether there's any likely expansion plans for a business in this regard. And that'll give you a sense of what issues are likely to be material that you should look at and assess, uh, and what issues perhaps might be secondary to the overall enterprise value going forward. Then when you get to the data analysis, a lot of what you're doing at this point is you're um, interviewing people uh, and you're looking at performance data and procedures. Uh, some of this might be around audit protocols, for example, because many people will have in place supply chain audits that actually give them comfort that a lot of their ESG commitments are being respected um, back down the line as well. Uh, obviously, there's a huge amount of documentation that you might be able to go through depending on what the paper trail is like in the businesses here. Uh, and there'll be opportunities to look at environmental management systems and whether there's environmental pollution uh, and things like that as well. The, the 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 validation step, the next step, and the analysis is it can be quite complex because this is where we go from the qualitative identification of issues to the quantitative impact they have on a business. And so, trying to assess um, the impact that many of these things might have on future value can be complex. But this is looking at things like risk management systems. Uh, in, in the case of textiles, this might be, and we'll just put some examples in here, this might be around you know, the ecological impacts of um, the dyes that they use and the transport systems they have in place. This might be around uh, some of the societal impacts that are likely to pop up in their supply chain and how you place an, an, imp an impact, or how do you do an impact analysis around that. And it might also be around uh, reputation and reputational risk. And again, how do you, how do you, conduct an impact analysis on things like reputation. Um, then, you know, for completeness, being able to package all of this up into a report is obviously the final step in all of this because uh, there's a clear body of work that's been done and a clear set of conclusions that come out of it. And uh, a lot of this can then be used for the purposes of further discussion uh, with the, the entity that's subject of the due diligence or any other uh, related parties that might be involved. Uh, investors, financiers, uh, future customers, uh, stakeholders like employees, really important as well. Uh, and so it's really important to be able to go through the process and have something sensible at the end that allows you to communicate a lot of these issues, including their risks and their opportunities with those people that are likely to be interested in them or affected by them. And importantly, Ash, it helps directors discharge their obligations 
to any organisation through the due diligence process by having undertaken appropriate steps to assess the risks and opportunities inherent uh, in any prospective investment opportunity uh, as it relates to ESG. Yep. And so, and so as you can see, you have a choice about how much time and effort you put into each of these steps. And so a good way to think about it is phasing. And with each phasing, there are, there is, uh, I suppose, um, more time and more effort required here, right? But we think about it in three steps. So, so what's the preliminary analysis that you could do? How do you get a red flag report out of this? How do you then validate and assess? And then once you've gone through a validation and assessment exercise, is it, is it worth then trying to quantify the impact on what some of these risks and opportunities might be? Right, so, so the scope for the red flag analysis would be the smallest scope that you can imagine. You'd look at management practices and policies, you'd identify uh, key issues, uh, and you could do some high level benchmarking on it, but the idea is to give, uh, to give someone uh, that's interested some kind of um, broad brush first pass on where likely ESG risks or opportunities will arise. The validation stage obviously is all about how you then go about working out if what you've identified as red flags is actually true or not. So this is about further research, this is about on-site assessments, this is about having conversations with management and trying to understand how management thinks about a lot of these issues uh, and then also thinking about intangible assets within the business and the impact of these things on reputation brand importantly consumer behavior and market confidence as well because what consumers want today may not be what consumers want in two or five years time because what they wanted five years ago is certainly different to what they want now when it comes to going green which is a phrase we've already used again when you get to the impact quantification that's where you're looking at trying to assign uh, scores to different types of metrics then you're assessing the financial impact uh, of each of those key ESG criteria uh, and you're looking at a whole bunch of different things within the business around compliance, around procedures, around reporting um, and also around um, some of the attitudes uh, that management may have to improvement uh, overall in, in relation to ESG issues uh, and obviously benchmarking where available. So depending on, depending on the, the level of specificity uh, or the level of comprehensiveness that's required in this process, there are different approaches you can take to an ESG due diligence. Next slide, please, Aletta. Oh, I think this is still me. Uh, okay, so just to give you, just to try and, I suppose, make this more relevant on an industry basis, because we, we look at industries differently in a lot of these situations because some risks and opportunities are more obvious in some industries. Here are some key highlights from just some of the industries that we've seen this pop up in. So um, consumer products, again, a lot of this is led, a lot of these businesses are B2C businesses, not B2B businesses. So consumer behaviour has driven a lot of uh, activity in this space. And so you can imagine a lot of these things are things that consumers ultimately care about. But in consumer goods, um, my, my sense is that um, a lot of this a lot of the environmental stuff is around packaging. So, so when we open our new products at home and we throw all the plastic in the bin, um, many of us start to feel a little bit frustrated and annoyed by that. And so we start looking for products that have more sustainable packaging outcomes. Uh, and you will have seen there's a myriad of consumer facing businesses that have popped up now where um, the way that they package and deliver their products is a huge value driver for them. There's a whole bunch of other issues that pop up here, obviously, um, in terms of raw materials. There are issues you'll often see around certification and responsible sourcing uh, and making sure that the, um, that the workforce is safe and that the supply chain is safe as well. Uh, product responsibility is a big issue, but it's matched to that, uh, often matched to that packaging and labeling issue too. Uh, and um, there are a few other issues there, but I won't go through all the dot points. I'll just focus on what I think some of the big ones are. Auto is really interesting. So auto, up until recently has always been about internal combustion engines and guess what internal combustion engines emit carbon and lots of it and so a big issue here is uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the consumer of the end product by the user of the end product uh, and so obviously there's a huge focus on EVs and many of you would be aware that um, 
Tesla is now by market cap the biggest auto car company in the world, which is bizarre when you think about how big the Daimler Chryslers and Toyotas and um, Volkswagens are um, out there. Regulatory behaviour is a big issue in auto, so many of you would be aware of Dieselgate, it goes under other names, but you remember Volkswagen was trying to avoid um, emissions detection, uh, and I think they agreed to pay something like $4 billion in fines uh, because of their behaviour to try and avoid those, those detection mechanisms. Uh, and so the regulators are very focused on behaviour uh, in, that, in that industry as well. Uh, chemicals and pharma, lots of issues here around uh, hazardous waste and how you dispose of hazardous waste. And the big thing around pharma uh, at the moment from an ESG perspective is effectively their ethical behaviour around super profits, around you know, benefiting, uh, uh, benefiting unnecessarily from sickness, uh, and also uh, fairness, right? Accessibility in developing nations. So how easy is it for people to get access to drugs and chemicals as well, for that matter, in countries where for whatever reason, the pricing just seems to be um, hugely disproportionate compared to their purchasing power. And, and then in uh, technology, media and telecommunications, TMT, uh, electricity consumption is a big issue here. So data centres, uh, you know, some of the most energy hungry things that you'll ever see. And we all run cloud-based systems these days. And so everything that we've got is backed up in a data center somewhere. Hopefully wherever it is, it's safe. But the amount of energy they consume is enormous. Uh, the other big issue uh, in this sector also is uh, ethical behavior and distribution. And what I mean by that is what, what impact are you having on your audience by delivering your product or your service? So if you're a social media platform and you know that a lot of what you're doing and the core elements of your service delivery, whether it be your algorithms or otherwise, is having an impact on teenagers in particular, then there's a real issue around what level of responsibility you're taking for the ethics in what you're doing. And same applies to media content, right, and content distribution. Are you, are you distributing content in an ethical way? Uh, and if not, what's the likely impact of that? So as you can see, different issues pop up depending on the sector. And so when you're conducting a due diligence, part of what governs what you look at is the sector in which the organisation operates that you're looking at. Next slide, please, Aletta. Thanks very much. So we, we thought we would, um, at the end, really bring to life an example uh, from a, an organisation that's doing particularly well on the ESG front. And that the particular case study that we've chosen is the Geelong Port. And this is very much a sort of a phase four of the deal life cycle value maximization opportunity. So the with respect to Geelong Port, Geelong Port is an asset that's recently traded hands, but in 2016 it was acquired by State Super and Brookfield uh, Consortium. And those organizations um, as significant investors in real assets and core infrastructure. Um, have have been some of the early developers of uh, ESG policies. And so there's an upstream, as upstream investors, there's an expectation that they place on their uh, portfolio companies and, and specifically the real assets that sit in those portfolio companies to address uh, ESG, uh, ESG elements. Um, also driving the, the, the ESG uh, policies and procedures at the Geelong Port is the need to mitigate risk. Um, from climate change and the adverse impacts of climate change, but also to maintain attractiveness in what is an, uh, an extremely competitive global infrastructure market. And so uh, investors are always looking for ways that they can uh, you know, enhance the value of these assets. And so ESG was, has been seen as um, a key uh, pillar to actually deliver on that um, objective. In terms of what the executive team and the employees of, of Geelong Port have done, in, in 2019, um, they released a 20-year environmental strategy um, and a vision to be Australia's most sustainable bulk commodity port. Four key focus areas or four pillars, if you like, of that 20-year environment strategy were um, or, and remain minimising resource use, eliminating waste and emissions, uh, nurturing port land because it sits on a 90 hectare property and supporting 
uh, an appealing, um, healthy uh, Karaya Bay environment. The four pillars are fundamental to uh, Geelong Port's approach to sustainability and in uh, and basically guide the actions that the port takes uh, in pursuit of achieving uh, its vision. And there's a quote there from the CEO of Geelong Port uh, in, in their 2021 sustainability update that specifically talks to this. And I think it's worth reflecting on this. So Geelong Port takes its environmental, social and governance responsibility very seriously. And we have developed strategies, policies and frameworks to support our goal of being sector leader in this area. And if you go to the website and you actually look at the, um, of what, about what that really means, they're effectively encouraging all of their employees in the organisation to bring ideas and to innovate and find ways of actually delivering against their ESG objectives to meet their 20 year environmental strategy that was released in 2019. And so a number of projects have been executed by uh, the Geelong Port team uh, in, in what has been a really short period of time since the release of the, the strategy in two, 2019. So in, in November 21, the port became the first port in Australia to achieve climate action carbon neutral certification. That was largely driven by the Barwon Region Renewable Energy Project, um, where Geelong Port uh, combined with Barwon uh, Health and Barwon Water um, have executed an offtake agreement to, that effectively underpins the development of a new uh, local wind farm um, in Victoria to source all of their uh, energy needs um, from renewable means. Uh, on the social side of things, in March this year, the Geelong Port announced a partnership with Deakin University, um, which is really focused on um, the Karaya based coastal ecosystem, climate change research, and what the port can do to. Um, you know, to nurture the port land and to uh, to ensure a healthy Karoo Bay um, and environment. Key question, obviously, on anyone's mind is, well, what has the impact been? So yeah, I understand the ESG impetus, I understand what management have done, but what has the impact been? Impact can be measured in lots of ways, financial and non-financial. In terms of the non-financial, in October 21, the port was recognised for its ongoing commitment to ESG transparency and performance uh, in the Gresby Infrastructure Assessment for 2021. And then a year later, um, it, was actually, it actually received the award uh, from the 2022 Gresby Infrastructure Assessment, which puts Ge uh, put Geelong Port at number one out of 26 port companies internationally. Um, which is a huge achievement in a very short period of time. In terms of the financial impact, and uh, it's difficult to quantify exactly what the impact of the ESG uh, measures have been, and I'm not suggesting in this, uh, this high-level analysis that uh, all of the incremental returns have been driven by, by ESG, but you would have to expect, and it's not unreasonable to expect, given the anecdotal evidence that we've seen in terms of pricing of deals, that the ESG initiatives and being at the forefront of, um, of change in terms of the real, real asset market and port infrastructure in particular has positively benefited State Super and Brookfield who have recently sold the asset to a new uh, consortium uh, reportedly for 1.1 billion. They acquired the asset in 2016 for 925 million. Um, if you thought about the potential um, equity returns, we're looking at a compound return of 9%, excluding any dividends that have been paid uh, by the business over that period of time. So when it comes to port assets, that's that's in the uh, well and truly in the top quartile um, based on some simple analysis. So again, we're not suggesting that all of the um, equity returns um, have been driven by ESG. There are obviously lots of factors that influence that but ESG is undeniably um, a positive step in the right direction. And there is more and more empirical research that's suggesting that um, what we're seeing anecdotally in the market in terms of deal multiples and cash flow impacts um, uh, is certainly, um, they are certainly benefiting from um, a rigorous approach to ESG, uh, which uh, is embedded in the DD process. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> if I was, um, if I was running a port, which I'm not, but if I was running a port and my port was voted number one port in the world based on the Gresby assessment, 
I'd be increasing my port access fees immediately because I was the number one port in the world. Maybe that's what the new owners are thinking about doing, I don't know. But um, the, the financial aspects of this apply not just to large infrastructure, it applies to all businesses, right? And, and you will have heard us talk about the um, supermarket chains before. Um, and we think it's a great example because they're probably uh, one of the leading areas where ESG is having a real impact on business performance up and down the supply chain. So as you would know, Coles and Woolies have a huge commitment to various aspects of ESG. Uh, and as a result, they're very focused on activity and behaviour in their supply chain. So, they, so we know, for example, that uh, if you're a supplier to Coles and Woolies uh, of non-grocery items, so things that, you know, like shelves, fridges, things like that, 65% uh, of your products has to come from recycled materials. So if I'm looking at buying a business that makes shopping trolleys for Coles and Woolies and their products do not contain the right number of recycled material, I need to have a think about what that means for the business. Either um, I lose my contract with Coles and Woolies going forward or I have to invest in whatever technology is required to enable me to produce trolleys that have 65% recycled products. That is a real example today. Okay, so the, so the enterprise value of those businesses is impacted by what Coles and Woolies ask them to do. Similarly, uh, again, another real example, if I'm a grape grower in the Riverina, Coles and Woolies comes to me and says, oh, guess what? It's really important that we have QR codes on our packets of grapes going forward because our customers are telling us that they want to know when their grapes were picked and what area of what state they come from. So guess what? Starting next week, when you send your bags of grapes to us, they need to have QR codes on them. I'm a farmer in Mildura. I say, what the hell's a QR code? Uh, you know, we've been here for four generations and we don't know what a QR code is. We've never needed it before. But I then have to either put QR codes on my bags or I lose my supply contract. So if I'm looking at that business and I'm looking at its future revenue and I know about these requirements in the supply chain, I've either got to discount the revenue fully because they're going to lose that contract or I've got to account for the fact that they've got to buy whatever machinery, plant and equipment is required to put QR codes on plastic bags. Now, they're just two very small examples, but that's happening everywhere today. And it's likely to happen even more in the future. So you can see how these factors have a very real impact on future performance, future financial performance. Um, financial services, we know for a fact that all the banks are doing this. NAB will not onboard any new suppliers if the suppliers don't meet NAB's own ESG requirements. Now, we don't know exactly what those requirements are, but we know that all the financial services businesses are doing this too. So everyone's caught in a supply chain. Everyone's impacted by what their customers expect of them. As a business, when, when we provide services to government and other organisations, we're often asked about our um, ESG commitment. And so if someone was looking to acquire our business, they would need to factor in that we have a risk around contracts, particularly with government, if our ESG performance doesn't meet the government's expectations. Again, all these things need to be reflected in the financial model. There's multiple examples of these types of things, but I'm obviously conscious of time, so I'm going to stop there and I'll let it all hand back to you. Thank you very much, Jaime and, and, and Ashley, and thank you for sharing the case studies. Um, often when we look at a case study and we real, hear the real stories, it kind of puts everything into place and into perspective, so we appreciate all of that. So for what our is... webinar attendees... Polling question. A polling question. Oh, we forgot about the polling question. Maybe we should do that. That's a good idea, Ashley. <laughs> That's my mistake. I'll launch the polling question. Okay, so we're just curious, for everyone that's listening to us, we're just curious to know whether this is a real issue for you at the moment or not. So we're asking whether your organisation incorporates ESG criteria into any due diligence activities that it engages in. So it may be that your organisation doesn't engage in any due diligence, um, but we suspect for many of you, you will. So do you not incorporate ESG into that process? Uh, do you incorporate ESG, but sorry, do you not incorporate it, but you think it'll be likely in the future? Or are you already incorporating ESG considerations into your due diligence activities? We're obviously running out of time, so we'll give you 
five seconds left? What do you reckon? I reckon we've got enough time, Ashley. We've got three minutes left. People need to think. We want Ten to maximize participation, right? So we've got good statistics here. Um, so I reckon I'll I'll leave it a little bit more. And I can talk really fast for the last minute or two, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> you, I can speed it up. You've perfected that art a little for some reason. <laughs> oh dear, always too much to say, too little time, Ashley. And I need to use all my words at work. Um, you know, to give my family a break. So when I get home, I've used my words for the day. You're all talked out. <laughs> I'm all talked out. <laughs> the only problem I've got is I've read somewhere that if you speak English as a second language, um, you know, your your English skills is like airtime. At some stage, it just runs out. So when I get really tired, I forget all my English skills and I can only speak up the cards. Um, so I have to balance that. So, actually, most people have voted. So Excellent. thank you, everybody, for um, voting um, and participating in our poll. And I'll share oh, the results. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went straight to purple. So 38% of you are already incorporating ESG considerations into due diligence activities. And another 25% think it's effectively imminent. So over, so over half the group, are uh, already doing it or will likely do it in the future. So that um, that makes our hearts nice and warm. <laughs> yes, that's fantastic. So I'll hide that away and then we can move on. Uh, so if you want to stay up to date with all the developments around sustainability, our monthly corporate reporting insights these days, the biggest part of this publication is actually around sustainability and ESG. Um, which is very exciting. Um, so please register for that. You can register on our website. You can also link with us individually on LinkedIn, Link with BDO Australia. Um, so here's just a link to register for Corporate Reporting Insights and you'll receive all the latest and greatest. Um, we also have uh, um, some areas on our website where we talk about sustainability and sustainability reporting. And so if you want to look at a one-stop shop on our website, there's a lot of information there. Um, on our website, of course, we have our sustainability report, but also how we can help our clients and the services we provide. From an education and training perspective, uh, obviously the webinar series, um, last one for the year, but you can register for next year. Um, we've released the topics for the first six months. Um, this area is developing so fast, we cannot release topics a year in advance. Um, IFRS is more stable, so we can do it there. But we also want to remind you of the free e-learning that we've got on our website, where you can work through a bit of an overview and examples in practice around TCFD disclosures. And we'll talk about that next year as well. Um, if you want to talk any further, discuss this any further, need some guidance, please reach out to, to me or Ashley or Hamish. And then again, finally, thank you, Ashley and Hamish, for sharing um, everything around ESG and due diligence. Um, and then and this is also our bigger team. Um, so if you're in Victoria, WA, Queensland, Sydney, South Australia, there's somebody local that you can have a coffee with or you can always reach out to any of us um, anyway. So um, I would like to say thank you very much for joining today's webinar, but also all our webinars during the year. Uh, we hope um, you have some time off over the festive season. If you celebrate Christmas like me, uh, Merry Christmas, and we look forward to speaking to you again on the 31st of January for our first sustainability webinar for next year. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, Lena. Bye. Thanks.